Welcome back. Hey look, it's another PSA. I've been doing a lot of these lately. Who would have guessed, right? Um, but yeah, being in the technology sector and being that it is a year where many people are still at home, you know, I've still got to speak about technology. So I'm always learning new things. And let me share with you what I've learned. Even if perhaps this um, this news is perhaps more rushed than other news I've shared with you in the past. Hopefully that's okay. Yeah, I was astounded today to hear about this, uh, this new technology, FLOC, and um, what this is, and why it's so important. So, this article is published by uh, Vivaldi. Um, they produce a web browser that's a derivative of Opera, and it was produced because, well, it's produced after Opera development, or the Opera team had closed uh, their feedback, um, or had become closed source, or something of this nature, and eventually um, some passionate developers said, you know, Opera is great and all, but I'm going to go produce my own thing now using the previous open source version as inspiration. And so, um, yeah, thanks to Vivaldi uh, for producing this uh, wonderful article. Thanks to John von uh, Tetchner um, of the Vivaldi Foundation. So no Google. Um, Vivaldi users will not get flocked. And so what is flock? Obviously Vivaldi is not in favor of what this is. So old habits die hard. Their new data harvesting venture. Remember uh, a good deal of their revenue comes from uh, advertising and information gathering. Which in itself could be perhaps a neutral thing if it were done in a not evil way. Um, but uh, Vivaldi sees this differently and so there's this new technology, the Federated Learning of Cohorts, a new advertising technology that intends to replace third-party cookies and related technologies like third-party local storage. This clearly is a dangerous step that harms user privacy. All right, so should I back up here? I think I need to provide a little context as to what this refers to. You know, when you go to a website, ever since that GDPR legislation went through, um, you frequently see these pop-ups that say, hey, there's cookies, and you might see that there's many cookies, or third-party cookies, or all cookies. What is a cookie? Well, it's some small snippet of information that's stored in your browser that um, if the website asks for the value of your cookie to help you authenticate or remember that you are authenticated and have a session. Okay, and then let me back up. What's a session? A session is the application server side. Um, uh, it's your... Uh, how do I explain this? If you have a set of transactions and you're logged in, so you logged in, you add a thing to your cart and you add a thing to your cart, and then you go switch to your other browser and you add another thing to your cart. And then you go on your phone and you add something to your cart, and then you go to Alexa and have it add something to your cart. Uh, this notion of all these transactions that build up together, or say you're on a social media site, you do a tweet here, a post there, a share this, a like that. All these transactions are built up in a server-side construct called a session. And that's just a way of identifying transactions related to your user. Or whatever the equivalent you think of a user being. But you are the user. There's something on the server that remembers who you are, hopefully. Um, if it's a site that you intend to be on, it remembers who you are instead of prompting you repeatedly. Um, but now there's an also a notion of 
you know, if I'm going to look for help on a website, the website might remember like what browser you were using, what time you visited the website, perhaps much, much, much more than those simple things. But there are cookies in your local computer inside your browser that when the server, the web server asks every time you click a link or every time you scroll over something and some information goes to that server and you get information back, that's an opportunity for uh, this cookie to be introspected. You might even play on an online gaming site. You might be uh, chess related or otherwise related to some online game. Um, that can periodically pull your browser and ask for information about what's your browser, what's your browser version, what's your IP address. Well, that you don't have to ask really. But it could ask for like what cookies, not just the one for the one website, but it could check do you have a Facebook cookie? Do you have a Twitter cookie? What social media cookies do you have? What other identifiers or fingerprints are on your browser that that website that serves up ads to you could be interested in? So that's the old way of doing things. And newer technologies about browser security and limiting which cookies you get and which sites are allowed to give you cookies. And you can do this do not track thing. And there's always new browsers coming out with new ways to block that advertising related stuff. Well, there have been ways to block things. And that brings us to where we are today with the federated learning of cohorts. Um, so what is a federation? Well, if you've played chess, you know what the International Chess Federation is. You know that each nation has like the U.S. Chess Federation, the Canadian Chess Federation, um, various other national federations all participate in the uh, International Chess Federation. So Federation is an international or otherwise distributed group um, that is comprised of smaller groups that could be themselves comprised of smaller groups and such, but it's a group of groups. So a federated learning of cohorts, and note the word flock, I think this is kind of intentional, but perhaps not. But you could think of it as like every computer or cluster of computers or some assembly of computers or network of computers um, can keep track of some subset of information and share it with each other. Let's get into the article and we'll come back to that. But the notion here that's unique here is this is not just a third party that you don't know about tracking you through some ad or some other cookie on the site. This is a fourth party, so um, so let's get into the article again. Again, thanks to uh, John Von Techter from uh, Vivaldi for publishing this post, which is informative, and let's get through it. Um, so Google's uh, new data harvesting venture is nasty, called Flock. This new ad technology intends to replace third party cookies and related third-party technologies like oh local storage would be instead of having that whole um that entire like cookie versus session thing local storage would just be they store tons and tons of data on your machine instead of storing it on their machines and having server-side sessions they just store a lot of data um to help track who you are or your preferences or other things. Um, so this is the new technology on the rise, not these third party things, but the federated learning of cohorts. According to John Votechter of Vivaldi, this is clearly a dangerous step that harms user privacy. And currently it's being trialed in Google Chrome and is a part of the Chromium browser engine. Probably didn't know about that. I probably didn't know about that, but we are learning together. So um, now the real question, 
What's Vivaldi's position on this new technology by Google? This seems like a pretty valid question, as Vivaldi is Chromium-based. But the truth is that while Vivaldi does rely on the Chromium engine to render pages, um, yeah, this is where Vivaldi is going to diverge and fork, and possibly even hostile fork, of the Chromium engine. So Vivaldi does not support this concept because Vivaldi stands up for the privacy rights of their users, at least in this regard. But I believe in general, I believe this is like community-driven development. Uh, they would be laughed off by all of their users if they took any other stance, is how I believe this works. That this is not... <laughs> Yeah, I believe this is more community-driven than other browsers are. And they have a ticketing system and that is communal and accessible. I remember years ago, they had made a change accidentally that broke Lee Chess, and several tickets got filed, or at least some tickets got filed, and they worked as speedily as they could to resolve those breakages. Um, so yeah, it took a little while to get the thing stressed. I was more than a bit morose about it at the time because I really liked the responsiveness and the community-driven nature of the browser. But um, yeah, it's, eventually I had to give and realize like this wasn't quite working exactly the way I needed to. Well, I might need to reconsider that. Um, so yeah, Vivaldi stands up the privacy rights of their users. They do not approve of tracking and profiling in any disguise. Then Vivaldi would not allow their products to build up local traffic tracking, rather, profiles. To Vivaldi, the word privacy means actual privacy. We do not twist it into being the opposite. We do not even observe how you use our products. Our privacy policy is simple and clear. We do not want to track you. All right, so what is this? A uh, flock of privacy invasive tracking technology. Google will continue to build profiles and track users in the absence of third-party cookies and local storage. Yeah, Google has um, a revenue model that requires them to serve ads to the right users, and they profit from this. And that's not necessarily by itself a bad or a malicious thing, but it does disalign incentives when um, users will try to opt out of things, um, developers will try to opt the users back into them in one way or another. Um, so that's just the nature of that relationship is that they provide free software, um, but things that are free aren't always actually free. Uh, so yeah, uh, Google presents Flock as part of a set of so-called privacy technologies. Uh, Vivaldi has a different characterization of this and characterizes this as a privacy invasive tracking technology. Uh, does this technology work in Vivaldi? Of course not. Um, that would be wildly inconsistent with everything they've explained thus far. Uh, but they do explain what is this component in Chrome. It needs to call Google's servers to check if it can function, because at least at present, Google's only enabling it in parts of the world that are not covered by Europe's GDPR. It seems there's still some discussion as to whether Flock could even be legal under GDPR. Vivaldi will continue to follow this closely and hopefully keep us informed. Although I'm slightly pessimistic about this, I'm not sure that Vivaldi has the might to keep up with Google, uh, despite the passion of the developers. I think eventually something will leak it's just a matter of months, years, decades. Eventually, Google will find a way to legally or tech-wise completely outpace um, them in the same way that like Heartbleed and Spectre and Meltdown and things like that that nobody could have anticipated were some 
subject to really easy attacks, comparatively speaking, easy in the sense that it wants you know the exploit, um, developing the proof of concept or copying somebody else's proof of concept and exploiting lots of machines was not actually too challenging or is not too challenging. Um, I think something of that sort will eventually strike here again that um, eventually somehow it'll be possible to collect information in a way that was only intended for Google to collect, but other parties might find ways to exploit that as well. Um, so, yeah, there are there are a lot of actors on the internet that all have different interests, and it's a matter of seeing who is controlling what, and uh, that kind of auditing is actually quite difficult. But uh, just try to keep track of which governments are making which regulations, which companies are developing which software in compliance with, with which regulations, and see um, Vivaldi will do the best they can to inform and keep ahead of things, but I'm not sure Vivaldi is equipped to keep up with a giant like Google, especially when there are governments that also have interests in being able to uh, tap information. Anyway, uh, that's some philosophizing about just some wild speculation on my part. Uh, I don't have evidence to prove it, but if I had to guess, that would be where I'd be guessing right now. Is that we'll, we'll try to keep ahead of this for now, but don't take everything I say as something that will last forever. Um, so although Vivaldi does use the Chromium engine, the Vivaldi group, uh, development group modifies the engine in many ways to keep the good parts, but also to keep it safe for users. They uh, do not allow Vivaldi to make this sort of uh, tracking call to Google. Or rather, to make this kind of call to check if you're in the non-GDPR zone. Um, they don't allow that call to be made. And they will not support the Flock API and do plan to disable it, no matter how it's implemented. <sighs> Again... I appreciate it's a noble effort, and in the short term, they will succeed. In the long term, I'm not sure what this means for Vivaldi, because Google is a giant, and they are clever. They have access to the world's best information. So, I don't know that they could track every possible side effect. I think eventually something will have to give, but the effort is lauded. Or at least I laud their effort in trying to keep ahead of it. Um, but yeah, they, Vivaldi does not like this Flock API and plans to disable it. And uh, Flock API does not protect privacy and certainly is not beneficial to users to unwittingly give away their privacy for Google's financial gain. All right, so why is Flock happening? Well, because third-party cookies are getting blocked by more and more browsers. This is what's causing... Um, Google to search for more creative avenues for drawing revenues. Uh, third-party cookie explanation, it's the same thing I was just talking about earlier. How do third-party cookies facilitate tracking? Well, these keep these are kind of like fingerprints that are stored in your browser. Over time, your browser builds up more and more fingerprints of your own and things you download. And these fingerprints help track who a person is. Um, all right, so how does this work? It'll keep a tab on your browsing history. So it intends to do all the profiling work within the browser. It sees everything you browse, so it gathers the data about your browsing habits and determines your preferences. Uh, this is not like a browser maintaining your browsing history. It's analyzing your personal behavior for Google. It decides which aspects of your browsing behavior are important. And if enough other people share that behavior, it assigns you and those other users the same ID. 
advertising companies no longer get to see a unique identifier, so they cannot see exactly what you uh, browsed, unless they also happen to be the same company that makes the browser that you're using. See, so they can't see you specifically. In theory, it does sound great. So perhaps I had this incorrect, but they can see every person who buys certain medical products to be in group this or that or this. Now things start getting ugly. So say if you got did one of those purchases and you got one of those IDs, they can display ads for the product, even if the particular medical condition is something you would rather keep to yourself. Well, it's all anonymized, right? Sounds like it should be all right, but... Mm, yeah, medical thing, I think they picked medical because that there are certain regulations pertaining to, um, well, people have an expectation of certain privacy, whether or not that's a realistic expectation. Um, but if somehow medical records actually leaked into this information, that would be nasty. But again, like websites... <laughs> They're supposed to, um, well, as far as I know, you can't actually get your medical records in this kind of tracking context. If you are dealing with some kind of medical thing online, I pray and hope that um, whatever it is you're uploading and downloading is strictly confidential and in no way ever leaks. I I would be astounded if that kind of thing leaked. But it is true that if you were to purchase certain products, those sorts of things um, I could foresee being tracked. But I'd be surprised if your personal information um, in some way leaked, like your medical history. Unless you were to type your medical history into a search, then then, yeah, who knows what you could end up with. Um, but if you've got one of these flock IDs, they can display ads for the product, and it's all anonymized, whatever. They can still work out that you have this certain medical issue. Mm, I don't know. That's a bit of a stretch, Vivaldi. I'm not sure I actually believe that. They can certainly target you, and if you've done like ample research on a particular medical condition... They might not know that you have this particular medical issue, but they might aggregate lots of information suggesting that you or someone you know probably cares strongly about a particular medical issue. Which, in an, informa in an age where people need information, often in a timely manner, yeah, that's a bit challenging. Um, and then yeah, you can work out like based on your other habits that you might be in a certain age group and such. Statistical analysis of those ideas is harder for small ad companies. They don't get quite so much data to work with. They don't see every website where the flock ID appears. The company that gets to know the most about the ID is the one that controls the largest amount of the advertising space, which is Google. Um, so they assert more dominance and they leverage their position. Um, I'm not so sure that this, not so sure that that in itself, anything that's presented so far is illegal in any way. I don't think so. It's concerning and alarming to users who don't know better. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure that it, is actually illegal any of the things described above even if the description of medical conditions i mean i don't know if you like search up for like runny nose or something everybody's gonna know oh this person searched for runny nose and if you search for like asthma they will look and see hey this person searched for asthma like uh, they'll know those sorts of things if you accidentally paste your medical information somehow into a browser or your browser reads it from your clipboard as you're copying something from a word document into i don't know an email or i don't know why you do any of those things but if your browser somehow reads what you have in memory uh stuff could leak 
it's scary. Um, so, um, is it legal? Probably. Um, at least in the U.S. So, yeah. I'll expose your data. So, we'll expose your browsing history and aggregate it in a new and unique way. I thought that this is actually having something to do with your information not leaking to Google, not leaking to a third-party tracker. But I thought this was actually going to be federated, because it said federated. So my assumption on this was mistaken. I misread the article the first time around. I was thinking this would be some distributed information harvesting effort, which would be absolutely nightmarish. And while I can't imagine that happening in the U.S., there are some countries where I could imagine a federation of this information gathering effort and social karma scores and things like that. Um, so, yeah, in the past, the ad company could only see aspects relating to the websites where its ads were used. Ad provider was only used for a thousand websites, would only have each visitor on one or two of their sites, so it'd be hard for them to build a tracking profile. Flock changes this dynamic um, and allows advertisers to know more about you and better target ads at you. Now, uh, every website will get to see an ID that was generated from your behavior on other website. Uh, websites that only have contextual ads or no ads at all could still get used in this calculation. So just because your ad display doesn't change at all doesn't mean that your information is uh, concealed. They could still be leaking information or behavior or whatever they're calling it. Whatever happens to be in the browser that looks interesting to... <laughs> well, this is interesting too, so... Oh dear. <laughs> so some people, myself included, had once used this product, I believe called Google Desktop, where Google would gladly index everything on your disk for you. And at the time, it was kind of great. It was convenient. Um, it could read all your documents and index them by keywords. And I think Microsoft had in some way released updates that improved the performance of Microsoft's document indexer and um, allegedly, I don't remember, crippled the performance of um, Google Desktop. But yeah, now we have something that's not quite Google Desktop. It's, as far as we know, as far as what's been said here, it's not actively harvesting information on your computer. It's just using the information that's available, accessible to the browser, which might include your clipboard, who knows, might include what you're typing on your keyboard, uh, even if the browser is not the active window, right? Because you can still like interact with background windows using the keyboard or mouse, even when the browser is not focused. So it could be collecting who knows what and uploading who knows what. It could be using your mic and your video, uh, your camera, whatever. Could be pulling whatever devices are attached or perhaps even on the same network as the browser. Um, because there are technologies you can use to control the browser from your home network. You can punch apps on your phone that'll show videos on a display using like Chromecast or things like that. And I don't think that that's um, directly tied into the browser. But the notion that there are technologies that um, the browser could interact with that aren't necessarily on the computer is also like, do we know everything that's in this code? I'm not sure that we do. So that's a bit concerning when they're doing information aggregation and we don't even know what sources they're aggregating it from or how the aggregation is done. I don't know that it would be fully transparent ever. Um, but it's not quite as evil as I was assuming it out to be at first, or as I was assuming it to be. Uh, has 
Also, if you're trying to make a strong argument, avoid this word. Um, it's generally not taken seriously when it's used. Try to avoid this word because people will diminish your argument if you use it. But, okay, they say that it has serious implications for those who live in an environment where aspects of their uh, personality are persecuted. Yeah, so this is a bit alarming if you happen to be traveling in such vicinity. Um, yeah. Um, again, I'm not sure how realistic this is at least in most parts of the world but yeah if i lived in such a country oh boy i would i don't know what i could say about this i don't know what i can say to criticize this concept of um, information gathering based on preferences because anything i can say would very likely get me blacklisted in said countries, so what can I say? I don't know. Um, I mean, so there's this argument that centers may have certain IDs, and theoretically that could be used to help target a person. I'm not sure it's quite so simple, but in theory that kind of pans out. Um, and if information's gathered in such a way, I would be surprised if it does not become federated at such a, a point where it's all like peer-to-peer -peer blockchain. You check what your neighbor's doing, even though that's not the current implementation. It's not hard to imagine such an implementation. So Vivaldi, um, uh, let's see could be concerning that we've reached a stage that a number, this ID, could be used in so many different ways. The reality is that ads existed even before tracking, but they were pretty contextual. If you we were browsing a car parts site, the ads were about cars. If you were, um, yeah, so you didn't need to feel creeped out because you saw an ad for some very specific product that you were looking at a week ago on a different website. And so yeah, that's a reasonable alignment where if you are focused on something and you get something back and it's related, okay. I think people don't find that too scary. Um, maybe they should, but they don't. But also there's only so much that an advertiser could benefit from this kind of simpler tracking. Uh, in all likelihood, this approach would return to be the dominant type of ad if only tracking would stop being used. After all, this buy-related thing is effective today. But instead of creating a world free from problems of targeted ads, we are facing a new reality. And they use words like surveillance, and this is kind of misused. So, uh, yes, co-founder, CEO, um, they've been doing browser development since 1994. When they're not using the browser or reading the forums, they enjoy collecting, playing with vintage computers and arcade games. Um, yeah, very cool. And they reside up in Massachusetts and they're from Iceland. And they're releasing all this personal information in an article where they say they don't like browsing habits and personal information being released. So that's an interesting spin out things, but yeah. you have to believe that they're a person and they want to give you a background to explain to you that they are a person and they're relatable in some way. But yeah, this is the perspective of um, uh, the co-founder and CEO of um, Vivaldi. So that's exciting uh, information, <laughs> to say nothing else. Um, so they, of course, recommend that you download their browser and use it, uh, as do their users in their forums. It's a pretty strong opinion. Um, 
other opinions could be found. And so I did another... <laughs> I did a Google search for this. <laughs> right? That's smart. Uh, how to fight back against this. So let's zoom in on this. Uh, this is by Marco Saric uh, on plausible.io. Uh, it will start to track your site visitors for advertising purposes. Even when you're not using Google Analytics or even when you don't have any relationship with Google. Um, so again, uh, it's not about improving your privacy. It's about violating your expectation of privacy. Um, and let's see, what is the federated learning of cohorts? It's what we just read about on the other site. Um, and it's being tested in countries, uh, outside of the GDPR zone. And so let's see, blocking third party cookies is a big win. Yeah. So Google is going to phase out third party cookies and intend to introduce this new other technology. And blocking third-party cookies is a win for user privacy. So I think on Plausible.io, they're recognizing that, you know, this cuts both ways. Overall, it's a negative for user privacy, but blocking third-party cookies specifically is an advantage. So it's not strictly um, wrong to say that this is a privacy improvement in some way. It just happens to have the opposite effect of improving, but it's kind of hard to square that because this is not all black and white. Um, the ad spend to become more concentrated on their Google's ecosystem. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so they own the browser with the largest market share and they just won this uh, Supreme Court case. So how exciting. Um, so without third-party cookies, Google still gets the data, uh, while everyone else in the ecosystem only gets the cohorts that Google sends us. So I'd misread or misinterpreted cohort is something completely federated. Now this is just the ID labeling given to a group. It's not that the group are regulating each other. It's uh, Google based on um, a pattern of browsing habits is identifying cohorts. Uh, could competition and markets authority in the United Kingdom has invoked, is opened an investigation to assess whether it could cause advertising spend to become even more concentrated on Google's ecosystems at the expense of its competitors. Good luck figuring that out. Doesn't sound easy. And yeah, Google is opt out by default. So you can find user preferences. Um, so how do you opt out of this? Um, well, number one, don't use that browser. Use Firefox or Safari or Brave or Vivaldi. Um, but if you do prefer to use this, this plausible.io recommends some steps that at least for now seem to work. But no, take seriously, like, take a look at these, take a look at this, take a look at Vivaldi, uh, make your own judgment, but take a look, because this will matter. Um, as a web developer, <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I'm not so sure that this is the right way about it. You know, setting a permissions policy about, like, what we're going to have a interest cohort permissions policy. This is playing on their terms. No, I don't really believe that this is the right solution. And my free software... <laughs> oh, man. So, you know that recently... Well... I don't recall whether I actually published the video at the end of it, but I ranted for quite a long time about the FSF installment and that history. Um, so I believe in free software. I believe in the mission of FSF is a great mission. And I believe that the FSF stands up for what's right. 
So, um, and that's hard to say, but, you know, these, uh, it's just a belief. And don't attack me for it, I guess. Um, and yeah, I, I think that user freedoms, particularly in licensing concerns, are important. And to respect um, the, uh, I don't know, you know, to me what it seems like the right game, the right move in this game of chess against Google here, it's not to opt into their thing. No. If you want your site to opt out of this, this is one option. Another option is to track the user agent. And if the user agent is Chrome, just don't accept, you know, say, you know, I think I recommend a different browser. Just tell your users about this story and strongly suggest to them that, you know, they should consider doing what's in that user's best interest in protecting their own privacy and just flat out refuse to serve them the web page. If this is your own website, if you don't, but I'm not saying you do this for like work or anything, but if you have your own website and you have the freedom to make that kind of decision, that would be an option for sure is saying, you know, I just don't feel like serving this particular browser. So again, like that's only if you have the freedom to make that decision. If you have contractual relationships that basically require you to act on Google's terms, then consider the following. But if it's entirely your own like gaming site or some other site that like, yeah, you completely control, consider playing hardball and not caving to this particular policy thing. But yeah, the article goes on. Once I saw this, I did not go on further because, uh, yes, while this is an option, this is not, it, again, for like my own personal development, if I were working on like some Scrabble site or some chess site or something like that, I would strongly consider uh, just blocking certain user agents until browser developers comply with user freedoms. And so, and by again blocking, I'd mean strongly recommending use of other browsers, but otherwise refusing to serve content. Just serve up the, hey, here's some secure browsers. Strongly consider using these um, if you value your own privacy, and you should. Again, that's just for your own gaming site, things like that, where there's not a contractual relationship in place that forbids you from doing that sort of thing. But if you are forced to serve uh, web pages to Chrome, then consider this kind of whatever this is, and I'm sure it's going to evolve over time. Things, technology's never that simple. The user agent in the header of a web request is pretty simple and has been around for decades. Um, but, well, I say it's simple. It's comparatively simple, um, especially considered whatever I expect to evolve here. But yeah, thanks uh, to this website, to this author. Let me scroll all the way back up to the top by Marco Saric. Um, of plausible.io. Thanks for publishing How to Fight Back. Um, yeah, and it makes the very strong point for your own personal benefit. You know, very strongly consider using a different browser. And yep. I mean, yes, ultimately society could perhaps do something to react to this, and corporations will react to the reaction, and it's just a matter of who can stay ahead of who there uh, because advertisers and corporations have one clear model and goal and pur purpose in mind and governments 
aren't necessarily single-minded in their efforts, so it could take them longer to try to keep ahead. Um, so um, that said, uh, I took a quick look at the Brave website. I've looked a little bit at this before. At one point I downloaded this at the time that Leech S 2.0 was released a few years back. Um, and I had made it my object at that time to download lots of browsers, install them all, get them all up and running, and then hit the refresh button on all the browsers the minute that Leech S 2.0 got released. And that plan kind of fell through because the 2.0 release was um, not the smoothest thing ever. It was tremendously complicated. Um, we got it done very quickly, but also it was tremendously stressful um, as it was pushed out because it was a big refactor of the web page. Um, and so, yeah, lots and lots of issues were tackled very quickly and correctly and then had to be fixed later in some cases. But, um, yes, I had installed this back at that time and I had tinkered with it a little bit. And I, at the time, like the notion of a browser blocking ads and trackers, you know, I thought... I could just keep ahead of this by installing extensions and managing browser settings and reading up on blogs and you know I'm a smart developer I can keep ahead of all this um, but I'm starting to think maybe I'm not so smart maybe these things I actually need to start valuing more um, when I choose my browser I also I was kind of surprised like by the uh you can earn something while you're using the browser which i didn't understand this at all um i don't know like what's the motivation for them to release this for free and also to reward you for browsing i don't understand that i will say recently i have um started syncing my content to a web page um my videos i've started syncing to odyssey or library lbry um and i don't intend to make any profit from that but they do have an a uh, bitcoin exchange i don't even know the right terminology for it but it is based on this coin or currency LBC and they're currently um, <laughs> they do everything very well in terms of documenting everything they do they're as transparent and as clean as I can imagine any company ever being and even so because they deal with a currency or cryptocurrency um, they are potentially under investigation by the U.S. government because um, the government may be interested in trying to track all online currencies, which would include LBC. So that would be tremendously disappointing for developers of Library and LBRY or Odyssey if that things ever do completely go that way with government tracking every online exchange so having briefly interacted very briefly with odyssey and lbry i can understand the notion of giving some extremely small pittance of a currency that amounts to fractions of a penny in exchange for silly things I still don't understand why they would reward you for using this browser. It befuddles me that, like, why would they do this? I don't understand that, and it surprises me. Um, the rest of this kind of makes sense, but I don't understand why they're doing it still. Um, so maybe we take a look at the FAQ for this. Uh, like, why is... I understand that Vivaldi 
I mean, there's all these browser developers that want to be taken seriously and they want to expand their share of whoever is using the browsers. I get that like hobbyists work on Vivaldi and there's no cryptocurrency involved in any way. Um, I think part of the motivation for Brave might be that potentially someday they could have an IPO, not that they have that today, um, but yeah, eventually, like supposing that they consider trying to monetize, I don't know, they will want to have as many people using their product as possible to leverage them to make, or help, to help them leverage their user base to profit in legitimate ways for whatever they deem legitimate. Uh, in a way that's consistent with their business model, their ethics, their mission statement, etc. Um, so can I zoom in on this slightly? Uh, somebody asked that when we do eventually allow ads through, will they have an acceptable ads model? There are two parts to the model. We do not allow the business model taking annual fees from advertisers to allow their ads pass unblocked. Uh, their business model does not couple their ad and flat fee based revenue to ad, which ads they block. Uh, they do use some filter rules that are associated with acceptable ads to block known bad domains and known bad URL patterns and to block and clean up after an HTML native ads. So I suppose at some point um, they will start advertising, um, but you don't have to pay Brave to go ad free. I'll be, be free to use. So what's the catch? We encourage you to support your favorite publishers with Brave Rewards or get compensated for paying attention to Brave ads, but these are voluntary. You can use one, the other, both, or neither. So you can opt into whatever things that your conscience so suits you to do. There are ways you can tip people through this browser. So I guess you purchase some currency and tip other people. And um, that's one way that the Brave can make money, I guess. Another is you can pay attention to Brave ads that I guess are opt-in. and um, Or even if it's opt-in or opt-out, it's hopefully fairly clear where the switch is for it. Um, but yeah, they have ways, uh, to draw money while also trying to get more and more people to use their product. Uh, why build a browser instead of using extensions? Yeah, I'm not so sure about the performance limits of extensions. If performance is seriously a hindrance for an extension, perhaps something's not coded right in the extension or in the browser or the browser extension API just sucks in that case. But yeah, maintaining the extension, keeping it up with the API is painful. And um, yeah, there could be counterfeit extensions. So Brave is trying to make things easier for you so you can make whatever decisions you want to make in terms of this brave rewards or brave ads or brave this or brave that you can clearly see what you're opting into so i guess that's their business model and why they um, are interested in this well brave standardize its intent casting protocol uh they intend to standardize it when multiple partners in different regions help help shake it out a bit it's a capital mistake to prematurely standardize so yeah they've got to innovate a little bit so uh, how are ads targeted based on browser side intent signals? So the browser knows almost everything you do, knows what sites you visit, how much time you spent, what you looked at, what's visible above the fold, and what's not occluded by opaque layers above the page, what searches you make, what tabs and groups tab you have open when making major purchases. Only the browser, after HTTPS terminates and secured pages are decrypted, has all the data necessary to analyze user intent. Um, 
Yes, they're not running some man in the middle proxy or VPN service or anything like that. It's only the browser that captures this. What's not so clear to me is do they also capture what's in the user clipboard? I'm sure users would riot if they knew if this captured stuff that was not entirely in the browser. But is this open source? I'm not sure. If this isn't open source and Vivaldi is open source, I'm more intended to go uh, select Viv or I'm more enticed to select Vivaldi or any sort of free software open source thing that I can compile on my own. Um, and I'm not sure that this can be compiled by just anyone. So. Yeah, I'm actually curious uh, what other people think about selecting a browser. Uh, what I'm trying to find here is like some mention of free software open source development. Uh, of course, if they were to release all their open source code, people would produce spin-offs and take all their hard work. Unlike Vivaldi, where they just give you all the hard work for free, but it might not always work exactly the way you hope. Uh, here, they attempt to make things convenient, but you don't control the source code. Um, so... Ah... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to consider this more. Uh, Rave Creators... So you can make websites and publish content. And something like that. Um... What if Binance shuts down? General, what is TriBrave? Send out emails to prospective customers. It's a legitimate own domain that is owned by Brave. So I'm not seeing anything in terms of like, where do I get the source code so I can compile it myself? Um, I'm sure some people will download this. Oh, hang on. They've got a company in GitHub. But... I'd be surprised if this release... I'm surprised. I am surprised. Okay, what's the deal? Is it just that the code's written in a way that is opaque? Or is this like completely false? MPL2, Mozilla Public License. Um, hmm. They have to disclose source, and you have to disclose the same license as permitted for all these uses. Um, there's no warranty on it. So, permission. Oh, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Permissions of the weak copyleft license are conditioned on making available source code of licensed files and modifications of those under the same license, or in some cases, one of the GNU licenses. Uh, you got to preserve the licenses. However, a larger work using the licensed work may be distributed under different terms and without source code for files added in the larger work. Yeah. <laughs> well... So to the extent that I can compile and build this on my own, I'm interested. To the extent that I have to rely on somebody else to give me this because I can't compile it on my own, that license is a bit concerning. So you can always visit the website to get the latest stable release, but there's no guarantee that the stable release exactly matches the code for reasons just mentioned. So, yeah, I would only, I mean, my first preference, I guess, would be to compile this from source, and if that works, consider using it. It might be a hassle to build this periodically and update it and rebuild it, and there could be security problems if I don't keep it up to date. Um, whereas if I were to look at the Vivaldi browser... Well, let me star this and follow it um, to just keep up with when how frequently releases do occur and if they continue occurring as uh, frequently as they tend to happen.
Uh, let's search all of GitHub for Vivaldi. I seem to remember Vivaldi browse. <laughs> Do yeah, so this is taken from Vivaldi. Oh, that's 2016. So there's a mirror up here somewhere that, yeah. Uh, this takes the source code from Vivaldi.com slash source, which is provided under the BSD license. Which, um, oh. Okay, so this doesn't require that the source code be distributed for Vivaldi either. There's, it's not like GPL, where you have to give away all the source code. But I think they do here anyway. I suspect that if this uh, project, if all these uh, folks, security, no, 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 this is security researchers. I'm not interested in that. Um, yeah, I don't quite get it. So, uh, I think users would probably be up in arms if Vivaldi snuck something in that wasn't in this source code. But there's nothing in the source that requires a uh, GPL style that all the source must be available for the final product binary that got produced. So, um, yeah, this isn't morally any better or worse. Um, let's keep tabs on how frequently this releases too. But yeah, that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure what else can be said. So both seem to be released under very similar licenses. Um, Brave has interest in revenue. I don't know what Vivaldi's interest is. Like, is this just done by a group of passionate people that have no profit interest whatsoever? Like, what is Vivaldi's stance again? Uh, are there a mission? We're building a browser that is powerful, personal, and flexible that adapts to you, not the other way around. Um, it's owned by its employees, and they plan to keep it that way, having no external investors, gives them the freedom to listen to their users and together with them build the browser that the users deserve. Every idea counts, and every idea is taken seriously. So, yeah, I don't know that I understand this. It's confusing. So it's owned by its employees. I don't know, like, I mean, that makes some sense. So they don't have to bow down to external investors. Even so, I'm curious, like, how did they ever draw profit from what they're doing? Do they, is this just completely non-profit volunteer stuff or they mentioned that the company's owned by its employees i don't get that vivaldi volunteers do grow as a community you don't need to be a community member to actually use the browser but i'm still confused like what this ownership is it seems really complicated I mean, kudos to them for producing something and releasing the source code for it. And there's a lot of options out there. So both of these seem like good, convenient things to install. I did download the installers for them. Uh, they both downloaded pretty quickly. But I am still super confused, like, what it is that motivates these folks I don't get it. Um, so, yeah, uh, either way, uh, thanks to everyone here for publishing all this information. And uh, yeah, just try to stay informed. The digital ecosystem is always evolving. There's too much to ever keep track of it all. Um, so here's the latest Brave news. And yeah, their motivation for disabling that. There's other features that are part of Brave. None of this is sponsored content, so just 
Yep, try to stay on top of things. If you find out more than I do, please let me know. If I find out more than you know, I'll let you know. That's our friendship here. See, so yeah, I hope this has been informative or at least fun or intriguing in some way. Um, and thanks to uh, the Free Software Foundation and the FOSS community for making such products possible.